mother asked me to go into the shop to pay the TV bill, you know, like you do, you go in the shop and you pay your bill. And she put the money in an envelope and I went into the shop and in them days they used to have the TVs all lined up on one side. They had the same newsreader, you know, the same channel on, you know, so you see the same channel. I got in the shop and it was sort of like, all of a sudden I just felt this sort of burning sensations in my ears, like heat in my ears. And it's sort of like, a, I can't expect it, but like a closing in, like a circle closing in. And the newsreader just turned around and said, the news is just for you. This 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 news is just for you. It's not just from here, it's from here, it's from there, it's from there. It's, it's all around you and you can't get away from it. I even thought they were a sort of mighty gods who ruled the world and uh, sometimes picked some people to tease and uh, to control. Voice hearing, I think, is evidence of psychosis. And psychosis is the big general term, which is equivalent, I suppose, to, to what people might say is madness. We were in the gym at school, and um, there's these ropes hanging up on the ceiling. And I, I felt quite happy. I didn't. I wasn't distressed in any way. I went in the gym and I heard his voice saying, hang yourself, do it now, hang yourself. And it was so strong, it was so powerful, it was, you know, and so frightening. I mean, I, as a kid, and I wet myself through fear. I, I wet myself. But I didn't know I was going mad. I, that, that, that actually, that never, I don't think I ever even thought of going mad. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> People hear voices for all manner of reasons, but I, I think the important reason is that they're suffering from a mental illness, and that's an undeniable thing, and voices are a symptom, one of the many symptoms that people have, one of the more dramatic and interesting symptoms, but it, it's a symptom of a disease process uh, which uh, is an illness and needs treatment. That has been the prevailing view of psychiatry for the last hundred years, that hearing voices is a sign of severe mental illness. Most psychiatrists believe that the voices are delusions and what they say has little meaning. They believe the voices should be ignored and suppressed with medication. But the issue has recently become the subject of hot debate in psychiatry, with the traditional view being challenged. This film is about an alternative view of the phenomenon of hearing voices. In 1987, a Dutch TV chat show was to be the beginning of the story of a new approach to hearing voices. The show featured a young woman voice hearer, Patsy Hager, and her psychiatrist, Professor Marius Rom. Welke manier kunt u Patsy helpen? Kunt u er helpen, trouwens? Ja, de, echt helpen dat de stemmen weggaan, dat heeft de psychiatrie niet te leveren. En als je er medicijnen tegen moet geven, geef je zoveel dan dat, dat feitelijk het hele denken alleen maar uh, zo versult. Zoals je zelf zegt, het is een, som, een zombie worden daarvan. Dus ja. dat is dan, ja, dan is de, eigenlijk toch de therapie ook erger dan de kwaal. I was trained as a psychiatrist, like still everybody is trained. And that means that hearing voices is a defect in somebody's brain, is something which is as a disturbance within the person and mostly connected with the illness of schizophrenia although we learned that it was not the only illness but in practice you hardly met people hearing voices not being diagnosed as schizophrenia so it becomes quite a kind of automatic connection between those two I began to hear voices when I was about eight years old and that was the age uh, on which I was severely burned. I, I looked at them as they were my friends because they were very friendly for me and told me stories and uh, had conversations with me, protected me from quarrels, kept me company. I thought it was uh, just normal to hear voices. The number of voices has always been the same. There were about 20 voices, and uh, 
there were two or three uh, important voices who uh, spoke up all the time, and the rest of the voices were behaved like a sort of back choir. Is that an English word? Yeah. And hummed. And uh, when I was about 15 years old, it became a problem. Uh, they turned to be nasty and uh, had a um, comment on my behavior, which was not very nice anymore. They told me uh, not to tell people about their existence and uh, also told me that I would be severely punished when I did. So I shut up. I, I never talked about them because I thought their power was uh, um, stronger than mine. Patsy was on the traditional route to the mental hospital when her mother introduced her to Marius Rom. Patsy was instrumental in changing Rom's mind about voice hearing being a delusion which should be ignored. Patsy challenged me to believe that she really heard voices. And I think the moment that she brought this challenge to my more consciousness was when she said, you realize that you hear, uh, you believe in a God in a church and you don't see or hear him. And there are lots of people doing that. And why don't you believe me? Because I'm hearing it in my head, very intensive. And that was kind of argument. I said, yeah, there you have some argument. Why do I do that? Why take this difference? I make this difference. Uh, ik geef u daarvan een telefoonnummer, correlatie in Utrecht. Nearly 500 voice hearers rang in after the show, and 35% of these had no psychiatric history whatsoever. Research in America has found that up to 60% of people hearing voices are leading normal lives. Nowadays, when there are so many people hearing voices never have been a patient, then you get the question, yeah, but is it still possible to observe hearing voices in itself as a pathological phenomenon? Because that's good as if everybody who hears voices is also a patient, but if about 60% isn't, then it becomes a little bit troublesome. So I was very enthusiastic and told that colleague psychiatrist, and then they thought I got mad. So my enthusiasm had to be reduced a little bit. I think there's a, qu a qualitative difference between uh, a normal person hearing, uh, being in touch with themselves, and this sort of alien experience of uh, voices coming from outside, uh, being very foreign, losing touch with reality, and being psychotic, which is really what it means. But since the TV show seven years ago, Marius Rom has continued to discover people leading normal lives who hear voices from the outside. One of these is Lucy Berkman, who recently heard the voice of her dead mother. Rom invited her to breakfast. You had some years of a conflict within your mind, let's say, is this marriage yes, worthwhile? Yes, I think 10 going years on? at least. Yeah. 10 years at yeah. least. Yeah. So at the, moment, at the moment, you did not have a made a decision in that period. Yeah. Was, Your mother um, in the middle of the day, I think 11 or 12 o'clock, and, and oh. I wasn't thinking of, of getting a divorce at all uh, at that uh, moment, uh, well, in that period, yeah. but not at that moment. I think I was cooking or something like that. And at once I heard her voice. Yeah. You got a little bit, oh, who's that, or not? Yeah, well, I, I had a feeling that someone was behind us, uh, somebody was behind me. Would she have been positive about the divorce? Oh, not at all. When she was alive, she would have. Uh, she would have think it, it was terrible to do so. She would have never agreed. You to do never that. agreed. Oh no. So it was in fact a little bit a different mother. This. Time. <laughs> it was a different mother. Yes. Kindly, friendly, supporting. Yeah. I was so afraid that when I talked to uh, someone about it. They would tell me, well, you were grow growing mad, mm -hmm. you have to look yeah, for help, and so, yeah. Mostly people aren't going to be enthusiastic. So yeah, well, no, I, I didn't. I uh, you did not didn't talk about, about it. And now you have been divorced, and you still hear these voices of your mother, or not? I like to hear it. Oh, you like so to hear it? So I, I, invite uh, her. Yeah, 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 that's the right word. I, I invite her time to time. Well, uh, 
Am I doing well? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, well, it's part of my life. It seems to be very important that the, at the beginning of the voices that we heard from people who had never been patients, as well as people who have been patients, that the background is either a trauma or a point of no return. A situation in life where you have to choose what shall I do? And the choice makes that you can't return on that choice. A number of recent studies have established a strong connection between traumatic experiences and the subsequent hearing of voices. Sexual abuse is one common trauma linked to hearing voices. Another, even more common, is bereavement. The last traumatic event I had really was um, losing my partner uh, who died. And I think that, although it didn't show itself as voices for a long time afterwards, was actually the, the beginning of um, a long period of coming to terms with that event. The voices being the, um, if, if you like, the um, whole event being brought back to me uh, in a very real way, because one of the voices I heard was the voice of the partner. Um, she um, she got herself into quite a state, um, and she she actually killed herself, which was um, was probably the worst thing. Um, the second worst thing being that um, I was the one that walked in on her. And I think that hitting you and having to actually find the, some, the person you love dead, then you, you get caught up in all this sense of guilt and anger and and all sorts. So, so I ended up sort of cutting off all relationship with parents and family and everything for quite a long time. I find it very difficult to accept an explanation of voices, that it's a buried experience that is coming back to haunt somebody, perhaps a buried traumatic experience that then gets split off in, in the form of a voice. Um, I agree, and it's my very firm view that voices mm. often have a very a, a worst fear quality that it's the things that the person is worried and anxious about which affect them in this way but i don't think you have to postulate that it's a, an awful experience which is being split off and and comes back in the form of a voice um, i think that's an additional layer of explanation that we don't need schizophrenia is often caused by life events life traumas but it triggers a process and I think that's the problem that uh, the, the, the psychological model fails to take into account, that there is a disease process which then starts running on. And even if you relieve the initial life trauma, the patient doesn't get better. I, I think when I was first diagnosed, I, I was quite relieved because um, then there was a reason for everything. There was the illness. I had an illness, it was treatable, and um, I thought nothing of that. But later on, when you begin to realise the implications of being called schizophrenic, like people's perception of you as a mad, axe-wielding uh, psychopath or um, people treating you as a pathetic person who can do nothing for yourself, um, that changes, that changes into anger. Um, and then you end up being alienated within the system because you're called non-cooperative as a patient. Alan Leader's first encounter with the mental health system began after he was continually distracted by voices as a child. His mother took him to see a psychiatrist. He just sat there with a pipe and just... an empty pipe. I always remember having an empty pipe and sucking air for this pipe, you know. Mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm. interesting, uh-huh, mm. And I thought to myself, what is Pratt talking about, you know? This is worse than the voices, this guy. He's just sitting there, just he's patronising me, you know. And he said, my mother, he said to my mother, I think this guy's got a problem. And my mother, I remember my mother said, well, of course he's got a problem, that's why we're here. You know, you don't, you don't need you to tell me he's got a problem, that's why we're here. Mm-hmm, interesting, you know. So the next thing I had after that is I ended up in an adolescent, in an adolescent unit. And I like actually in hospital, in Hill End, in St Albans. And, uh, well, my psychiatric career started, really. 
But the conventional diagnosis of voice hearing by psychiatrists, which can find patients like Alan Leader and Ron Coleman to mental hospital, often for long periods, is now being questioned by some psychiatrists influenced by the Dutch experience. They believe that the majority of voice hearers can learn to live with their voices, often with help from other voice hearers. Ron Coleman was invited down to North Wales by community-based psychiatrist Phil Thomas to run a workshop on hearing voices for a group of mental health professionals and voice hearers. If you think of the great diversity of experiences that people can have who hear voices and have a, an enormous wealth of different types of experiences, psychiatrists are actually only interested in 15 to 17 very narrowly defined aspects of that experience and they seek no further. They will not ask any questions beyond that simply because that fits in with their own particular view about what the significance of that experience is and of course that view is a fairly narrowly defined view that hearing voices is part of an illness, it's part of a, a disease, usually a psychotic disease. So I'd like to welcome Ron Coleman, who's from the Hearing Voice Network in Manchester. And uh, we've come to work very closely over the last uh, 12 months, and it's a great opportunity to welcome him to Dog Etli today uh, to talk about hearing voices. Thanks, Ron. What we're going to do is we're going to let you see what the voice hearing experience is like. Us voice hearers don't need to do this because we know what it's like. Right. And how we do it is we split into threes. Two people talk to each other, and one person plays the voice, gets up close to the ear, and starts saying things. He's lying to you. He's lying. Turn away. Look, look behind him. You're going to do something with him. What did you do with me? Yeah. Yeah. She's silly. Yeah. Yes, don't take any notice of her. Yeah. Yeah. It is very difficult. I think he's had enough. <laughs> because we're actually needing to do a certain amount of work in that meeting. We can't actually contract the business. Now, put yourself in that situation. But it's not one voice you're hearing. It's two, three, four, a multitude. And it's not just for a minute or two. It's going on all day. What are the consequences of that? Let's start with your feelings. Well, how would you feel? Very confused. Right. Confused. <clears throat> Frightened. Fear. Angry. Yeah, you get angry. angry. Yeah. You were quite angry, weren't you, at one stage? Yeah. You get angry mm. about it. Victimised. Victimised, yeah. Now, if you're feeling victimised, what can that lead to? Paranoia, right. Yeah, you think you're off your tree. Mm. Don't you? you think you're mad. Mm. It's a natural response. You hear voices, there's nobody there, you think you're off your tree. OK. That list that we've got... Confusion, fear, irritated, need to escape, harass, poor concentration, anger, victimised, paranoia, disjointed thinking. Where do you get that list? Where do you find that list? Or a list like it. Secondary symptoms of schizophrenia. But we were talking about consequences. Can't be both. Can't be symptoms and consequences. It's got to be one or the other. Consequence or symptom, chicken or egg, there's heated debate. But can research into the brain help us to understand what's happening in the mind? At Hammersmith Hospital, scientists have designed brain scanning experiments to investigate what might be happening in the brains of people as they hear voices. It will feel a little bit uncomfortable. The first step was to look at people who don't hear voices. What we found was that when normal people are thinking in sentences, um, which is a, equivalent to inner speech, um, the left frontal part of the brain around this area here uh, was particularly active. And this is an area classically associated with 
speech production, that is speaking out loud. So our study suggested that the same parts of the brain that were involved in speaking out loud were involved in silent articulation or inner speech, that is thinking the words rather than saying them. One of the experiments we went on to do was to study uh, schizophrenic patients who hear voices very frequently. And we studied them while they were actually experiencing these voices. And we found to our surprise that um, a similar pattern of areas were active when they were hearing voices as if they were external. Um, so that is, we saw activity.